We've been trying to work our way through the book of James. And if you were to think about the challenges within the Christian life, how, how important would the words you say rise to that, that list? Actually, if you read the book of James, a lot of what he has to say talks about how we talk, how we talk to one another, how we express ourselves in the world today. And he comes to this verse, in James chapter 5, verse 12. And the verse kind of just stands there by itself. And so this morning, I want to kind of just take a look at this one verse and look back over the way James has dealt with this topic of our speech, how we talk to one another. James 5.12 says this, Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you'll be condemned. It takes a lot of energy into this one verse, doesn't he? I don't know how you've thought about this idea of swearing and that kind of thing, if that's a, a, a habit that you have picked up and you have uh, not paid much attention to, or if it is something you notice in the world around you and is uh, uh, just perks up your ears when you hear people who seem to take the Lord's name in vain very casually. How about other things? How about swearing in terms of taking an oath? Have you ever been part of a, like a legal proceedings where you have to raise your hand and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, right? And sometimes our oaths are serious like that, or sometimes there's that's kind of a childish thing that comes up in our hearts and minds, and we could be like a child saying, you know, cross my heart and hope to die, you know, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye, or stay, in, I, don't, I never said that as a kid, but uh, maybe that was part of your, you're grown up and those words sound familiar to you. Soaring oaths, right? It was really a, a part of the ancient Jewish culture and certainly part of the Gentile culture, and remains a part of our culture today. This this morning, as I was uh, kind of doing some work over the past week for this message, I came across a sermon by John MacArthur, and in it, he quoted from the uh, Masonic Lodge their oath of, uh, uh, of belonging. I don't know if any of you are part of the Masons here today. That if you are, I hope this oath is, sounds familiar to you. They are charged to swear this binding myself under no less penalty than that of having my throat cut, my tongue torn out by its roots, and buried in the rough sands of the sea at low water mark, where the tides ebb and flow twice in 24 hours, should I ever knowingly or willingly violate this my solemn oath and obligation as an entered apprentice mason, so help me God and keep me steadfast in the due performance of the same, binding myself under no less penalty than that of having my left breast torn open, my heart plucked out and given as prey to the wild beasts of the field and the fowls of the air, binding myself under no less penalty than having my body severed in twain, my bowels taken from thence and burned to ashes, the ashes scattered to the four winds of the heavens, so that no more trace remembered may be so vile and perjured as a wrench as I should I ever knowingly or willingly violate this my solemn obligation as a master mason, so help me God and keep me steadfast in the due performance of the same. Two sentences right there. So if you want to join the Masons, if you're not already a member and you think maybe that would be helpful for you, that's what you have to swear to. You have to swear that you, know, you would give your life if you don't keep your oath. I don't know if you've thought about this, um, the swearing, making oaths, what they do to the gener general conversation, right? When, when we make oaths, clearly we're trying to stem what we all recognize as this natural tendency in human beings to lie, right? Jesus talked about that, he talked about how natural that is to resort to the lie in really any kind of circumstance within us. And in one a confrontation, he said this. He said, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native language, 
for he is a liar and the father of lies. Even strong oaths, right, don't change a a person's heart. Sometimes, actually, the more passionately someone declares, I'm telling you the truth, it's really true, I know it's true, I swear it's true. Sometimes, right, like, uh, what was her name in uh, Hamlet, scene two, actually, Queen Gertrude, what did it, what was the line? The lady doth protest too much, methinks. All right, have you heard that line? There's a sometimes, the more we swear that we're telling the truth, the less, uh, credible we become. The truth can sometimes be presented too artfully, too elaborately, too insistently. And so James writes to his church, people gathered in Jesus' name, trying to live out their lives within a very pagan and unfriendly context. And he writes to them and he says, above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear. He's urging a change in the speech patterns of people that name Jesus. He's urging an honesty, an honest approach to life that needs no oaths to be believed. And the pattern of their speech should be so genuine that a simple yes or no carries the same as any oath. You make an agreement and your agreement is good. You say no, and you really mean you didn't do that. That wasn't you. You don't have to swear. People recognize that you have been honest with them from the very beginning. Throughout this whole book of James, it's come through from the very first chapter, clear through to this moment, and yes, even more as we go through the how we talk. How we talk is important. It says, above all, right? Above all, right? You think how many other things you could put above how we talk? Why is it that this becomes so important? Right? It's a command to us. It's given some kind of priority for us. And this verse seems to be kind of a standalone verse here at the end, but it's not the first time James has addressed this topic of how you talk. If we were just to listen to you, to your language over this past week, what would we learn about you? What, what would be revealed about your heart? What would come up? All, all through this letter, James comes back to this topic of our words. It came to this point in the first chapter where he said everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Later in that chapter, he says, those who consider themselves righteous and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. The second chapter says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. And chapter 3 says, anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. All through the third chapter, right, he's talking about how we talk and what the tongue can do and the, the little spark it can provide to set a whole forest on fire. And chapter 3 is a lot about how we talk the influence it could have, the importance of paying attention to the words. There's that prayer from the Psalms, right? Says, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Right? The words of our mouths are way more important than we think. Finally, in the fourth chapter, we read, Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. The damage that we can do is only matched by the opportunities that can come from how we talk to one another. When you think about that, kind of the topic in general, right? It, it, how we talk does two things for us, right? It's important for two reasons. First, how we talk reveals what's true about us. Above all, right? Above all, James says, don't swear, right? Be careful how you talk. It's way more important than you think, the words that you use. Jesus had been talking to the people, and in the Sermon on the Mount, as people gather and sit there, he had a lot to say about what we talk. And later he explained why that was so important. Chapter 12 of Matthew says, For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. 
So I've told the um, story several times here uh, of my experience and just being so exposed by what came out of my heart. So the story is that I was driving uh, home uh, with some friends from a service in a rest home in Lincoln. So friends and I, uh, as part of our youth group activity, would go to have these Sunday afternoon services at local rest homes. And like a good Christian boy, I, I went along. And I think even that day, I was supposed to bring the devotional. I probably read it out of a book or something like that. And uh, so we had gone and done this nice service in, in the rest home and sang songs with the people there. I'm following my friend home. And uh, have a, one of my uh, co-youth group members in our car w- with me. And I'm driving along, kind of having fun, you know. And my friend in front of me stops at a stop sign. Crazy guy. What's he, <laughs> what's he doing? But I, I was following too close. And I didn't stop quite in time. And we have a little fender bender, me and my fellow uh, youth group member, Service, serving the Lord faithfully Sunday afternoon, and I get out of the car, and I don't remember the actual words that came out of my mouth in that moment, but it wasn't words pleasing to the Lord. And my passenger, one of the fellow youth group members, she, she turns to me and she says, Nathan, what's coming out of your mouth? The truth is, that what was coming out of my mouth in that moment was more representative of what was going on in my heart than all those other words that I had shared in that service in the rest home. It was what was true. Those times in life where we recognize that things are not going right, those times in which the circumstances of, of life bump us, what comes out it is more representative of what's really true about us. And we need to pay attention to what's coming out. Not just in the easy, good times when we feel like we're in control, but in those moments of life where the circumstances are tough and hard. Is God's good work going on inside of us or not? What's, what's coming out? of us? What is revealed by how we talk? Certainly that's one part that makes how we talk really important. It's, it is a litmus test or an example of what's going on inside of us, but it also enables our ministry to others. When James writes this letter, and even in this moment where he's saying, look, above all, he recognizes something about these people. He describes them as brothers, brothers and sisters. He, he's saying to them, we're in this together. We're in this together. And watching what we say, isn't, it's not enough just to not say anything, to like put a guard over your mouth, right? Somebody has said that, that uh, your tongue is so dangerous, that's why God put it in a cage behind your teeth, right? <laughs> so that you can keep track of it, right? But the reality is that we need to talk to one another. You need to say and to be engaged. You need to talk. It's important that you talk, right? I know that they say if you can't say something good, don't say anything at all. But you can say something good. That's the purpose of coming together. You're to say something good. You're to find in your heart concern for one another. You're to be able to share what the Spirit has worked in you for the good of other people. That's what you're doing here. That's what church is about. That's what God, why God calls us together in our fellowship. It's not just here, but in every church. That's the purpose of it, to minister to one another. It's, the answer is not silence. It's honesty and genuine care. Because you can say something good. Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus and he added this idea. He said, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. It's, it's, a, it's hearts that have been impacted. It's people that say, yes, I'm willing to get engaged with one another. It's the truth in love. 
right? Hearts that have been changed, that care about people that the Lord cares about. Not, not just in church, right? You're to speak to people wherever you go. It's important. It enables your ministry to one another. How you talk <laughs> is important. But when James writes, he has a very specific kind of talk in mind. He, he has one thing that he really wants to finally say, hey, listen, listen to what's coming out of your mouth. And he's saying these things. He says, do not swear. Don't swear. Oaths, right? Oaths are to be avoided. Don't swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. There's lots of other kinds of talk that are encouraged or discouraged in the New Testament, right? Like in Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about unwholesome talk, right? Those kind of damaging kinds of words. But here James focuses especially on oaths. Hmm. When you, when you hear people use the name of God, the name of Jesus casually in their conversation, it's it's really an oath. You're, you're calling, I know they don't mean it, they don't think about it, but they're calling on God to witness what they're saying or to, to give expression to their wonderment in the midst of their conversations. And that really is what James is talking about here, a misuse of God's name as part of the Christian's conversation. And James is saying, cut that out. Really, Listen to how you use God's name. Not heaven, not earth, but God made, right? Those things represent the creator God, not anything else. He's saying, don't swear. Jesus, really, on the Sermon on the Mount, has made this point previously, and I think that's what James is drawing their attention back to. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said this again. You have heard it said to the people long ago, don't break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord, the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it's God's throne, or by the earth, for it's a footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And don't swear by your head, for you can't make even one hair white or black. If we could, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> all you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So Jesus is condemning the practice of people who were in the habit of swearing oaths to many different things. And in the practice in Jesus' day, they found some oaths much more binding than others. For you and I, we don't quite have that same practice in our day where we kind of say, okay, you can say, you can swear by these things, and it's not really quite so important, but by these things, right? Oh, man, if you swear by these things, you really have to do what you want. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus goes on to talk to the Pharisees and say, look, you swear by the temple, and you think, oh, I'm just swearing by the temple, but if you swear by the gold of the temple... Now you really have to keep your word. And it's a practice Jesus is exposing where they use oaths to actually tell a lie or to deceive people about what their actual intents are. Don't do that. Don't use oaths to deceive. Right? You're trying to tell a lie or you're trying to convince somebody of something past. Yes, I promise that that's the way it was. I swear that I didn't do that. And you did. They're using an oath to deceive. Jesus teaches them better to simply, like James is saying, let your yes be yes and your no be no. All, all through the Bible, really, there's, there are these kinds of oaths. You, God makes a, an oath with, uh, the whole, with the whole creation, right? He gives this covenant to Noah. It's a kind of swearing. It's kind of an oath. It's God gives his word that there'll be a never another flood like Noah's flood. Or he turns, finds Abraham and he makes a covenant with Abraham. It's a kind of swearing. It's kind of an oath. He repeats that oath to Isaac, to Jacob. It makes a covenant with David. So there, there is in God's word these kind of oaths that God has taken on himself. And God's word is always true. 
It's always to be treasured. And it seems like in those instances that God himself chooses to use a human form to make clear his dependability. But not to deceive, he, he equips the priesthood with a kind of process for finding out when someone is telling the truth through that to human tool of, of youth. And the psalmist in Psalm chapter 15 asks this question, who, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? And one of the answers to that comes in verse 4 where it says, he who keeps an oath even when it hurts. Hmm. Don't use your oaths to deceive. There seems to be a place for uh, oaths within the, the ministry that God has entrusted to us. One of those places comes in the, the marriage ceremony where we exchange wedding oaths. Okay, wedding vows, we call them. Right? We give our word. We promise in, in, with you know, God as our witnesses that we will be faithful to our spouse. In sickness and in health, right? All those uh, phases, richer or poor, till death us do part. The marriage vows. And Jesus, there before King Herod, they, you know, he's examined and they say, are you the son of God? And Jesus says, you have said it. It's kind of an oath and Second Corinthians chapter 1, Paul uses a kind of oath. I call on God as my witness in that kind of moment. He takes a, a kind of an oath. But James says, better in your conversation, better in your daily work to avoid those kind of things. Specifically, not, avoid oaths in general. Don't use oaths to deceive, but specifically, James is saying, don't misuse God's name. Right? Not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All those things that involve God. Don't use God to convince other people that you're telling the truth. It is one of those that come right out of the Ten Commandments, right? God sent uh, Moses up to the mountain to receive his Ten Commandments, and kind of the third of those two commandments goes this way. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. God's name is holy. Misuse is damaging. So I see it all the time, don't you? I, I see it and hear it in everyday conversation. This is for you. It's not for the world, okay? You, you, you're, you can be a good example, but it's really not for you to correct everyone in your, your circle. But for you, I, I want you to rethink how you use God's name, even like the initials, OMG, or other things like that. Would you, would you just give yourself permission to say, there it was again. I don't, I don't want to use that phrase. When you say, oh my God, I want you to be focused on God. I want you to be acknowledging who he really is. I want you to be aware of his presence with you, his help in that moment. When you say those words, when they come out of your mouth, let them be real, not just what you hear around you every day. We live in a pretty casual place today when we come to God's name. But for people, for you that know him, for you that have recognized that in Jesus there is forgiveness and help, there is healing and wholeness, there is what you need for life through God's Son, that his name is precious to you. Let's honor it in that way. Don't, don't use or misuse God's name. Honesty really is important, right? How we talk is important. Oaths are to be avoided. And in this whole picture of letting your yes be yes and your no, no, right, is this idea that 
you have developed a pattern of integrity where what you say can be trusted. What you, what you agree to is binding. What you deny carries weight. Right? Your yes has become yes because of the way you have lived your life. It's really important to be able to believe the people around you when they ask you a straightforward question. You'll say the truth, right? The whole truth, nothing but the truth. Right? Believability, right? It's kind of a word I made up this past week because I was thinking about this. It reminded me of a little saying that's been going around for some time. It's like this. If a man says he will fix it, he will, right? There's no reason to remind him every six months. So your will, when you say you will, you will, right? <laughs> It shouldn't be that way. People should know they can depend on it. But I skipped over uh, several verses at, in Psalm chapter 15 earlier. Remember, that's that psalm that begins, who may dwell in your sacred tent, who may live in your holy mountain. The second verse of that psalm says this, the one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their hearts. That idea, speaking the truth, letting it come out, not just in what we say and what we don't say, but in how we live matching up, right? A walk who's blameless, who does what is righteous. And in a sense, how you live, your integrity reflects on your Lord. It becomes real. Today, as uh, people struggle with the challenges faced within our culture, right? A culture that's not very impressed by people who name the name of Christ. I, I think that we who have lived for him who have experienced his life, who gather in his name, haven't always been the best examples. And it's not just what we do to one another, it's how we live out in the, the community. And we have a book in the back, um, a kind of a directory, you know, kind of the Christian business directory. And in that book, there are all sorts of people that offer services and they put a fish on their service. And if that's you, if you identify yourself as a Christian and you're a businessman, you need to be aware that the way you treat people, the, the integrity you have as a service provider is really important. So I'm, I'm fairly openly identified as, as a pastor in, in the community. And uh, I, it really bothers me when people say, this guy was a Christian. I found him in the Christmas business directory, and he did this, right? And they, they complain about businessmen who haven't kept what they thought was the, what the person thought was their word or done the subpar kinds of work. Integrity, right? It's really important to the cause of Christ that you who are identified with him live in a way that honors his name that you speak in a way that reflects not just uh, honesty and integrity, but God's listening ear. And when you say yes, you mean yes. And when you say no, you mean no. Finally, this verse, this passage, this topic comes with a fairly serious warning. It says this, otherwise you'll be condemned. It's a really strong word. It's a really strong word. And I don't think it means that you never make a mistake in how you talk or God's name doesn't slip out kind of in a worldly pattern out of your lips. Because listen to what he says in chapter 3. He says, We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. We're not talking about people that never make a mistake. We're talking about people that are aware how serious this is, that are seeking God's control over how they talk, that their language, the words of their mouths, and the meditations of their hearts, right, reflect God's control. In the book of James, James addresses lots of topics kind of like this, topics of how people behave and, and how they orient their life and all those kind of things. And in it, he is offering to us kind of a test. Is it real? Is God's work active in your heart and in your life? It doesn't mean that you're perfect, right? Just like this verse says. 
It means that you're responsive, that there is a foundation of God's work. There's change happening, that you recognize that piece of his activity in your life. Is it real? So it is. We come to the end even of this thing. and It's, a, it's as much a, a call to, to pay attention as it is a warning to embrace a pattern of truthfulness, to submit even the way you talk, the words you use, to God's control. And it becomes the evidence or one of the evidences of a transformed life a life where we embrace honesty and integrity and a straightforward pattern of speaking. That makes sense to you? Do you see how important that is to live in a new way in a world that has a very different pattern that they're following? A dependable and honorable pattern of speech that James says is more important. Above all, my brothers and sisters, he writes, do not swear. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. Hmm. So today, let me just invite you again, as I mentioned earlier, to look back over your own speech patterns, the things that come out of your mouth. And let me Im encourage you to invite the Lord by his spirit to take control of those patterns so that you can speak in ways that honor your Lord and that he can be honored and glorified in what we say. So, Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the moment to come under your hand and under your control and to again listen to what comes out of our mouths. Lord, again, we would pray that you would be honored in those words. But more than that, that you would do your work inside of us, that the words that we come out would really reflect the work that you are doing, that there would be coming out gracious words that reflect the understanding of how much grace we've received, that we would look on those around us and give forgiving words because we recognize so much of what we have been forgiven for that out of our hearts, we would bring forth words that honor your name and reflect the, the work that you're about in us. Hmm. So maybe you're here and those words have found a, a, a place, right? A, a, a way, a kind of a, brought you to understand God's work in a new way in your heart. And this is a moment you can just surrender again and ask for his help. And if you will simply say to God, Lord, help me in this area. I want your help. Put a watch over the words of my mouth. God will help you. His spirit will, when those words want to come out, he'll be faithful and he'll say, wait. And then in that moment, you'll have a choice <laughs> to respond, to turn it in a new direction or not. So, Father, I commit each one of these here to your hand, to your work, and to your faithful care. In your name I pray. Amen. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. May you go in peace. <laughs>